the National Portrait Gallery in London, where there are thousands upon thousands of faces from the past and present. For centuries, we've immortalized them in pencil, paint, and through the lens of a camera. And each year, we mark the passing of people we may never have met, but have meant so much to many of us. There was an energy here that brought something out in me that excited me. In 2023, we lost legendary singers and composers, sporting greats, political trailblazers, order, order, order. and household names on both the big and small screens. All men are fools. And what makes them so is having beauty like what I have got. <laughs> They've been part of our shared experience, woven into the storylines and soundtracks of our lives. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Welcome to a new series. What made their lives so extraordinary? The lasting legacies of lives well lived. Still filling theatres here and around the globe, the story of Tina Turner. It's one of talent, pain, violence and superstardom. That journey from Nutbush, Tennessee to the world's biggest stadiums is still enthralling audiences today. The sheer adrenaline and excitement of her performance made Tina Turner one of the greatest singers of all time. I want to hear you sing! first black female performer that I saw who was unashamedly rock and roll. She was a master of owning the stage and she was a master of the craft of movement, of stage presence. Tina, of course, was absolute life force. A human dynamo. Oh, you be good to me. She had a way of transforming songs so that she owned them. No she had a way of increasing the resonance of it so that it was resonating with millions of people. Born Anna Mae Bullock, she started singing in her local Baptist church. But when she met Ike Turner, it changed her life. Front and center of his band, he named her Tina Turner before they were married. It was her voice and presence that brought them stardom. Tell me the first time you became aware of Tina Turner. The first time was in the late 60s when Tina was on TV. Sitting there as a teenager, I couldn't believe it, what I was looking at. To see her, though, perform was unbelievable. This hair with her legs open, that's what I want to stress. That was transgressive. It was amazing to see. And she was in your face, literally. My mother would have probably loved her, but would not have loved me being like her. I wonder if that shocked quite a lot of people. I mean, that open leg stance was something that nobody else was doing. That power stance is such a statement for a woman to make. Good job in the city. She's saying, 
You have come into my world and you will follow my lead. We're going to have fun. It's going to be energetic, entertaining, and I am the commander in chief. Just by that stance, let alone the rest of the physicality. And I love that. There would be no Beyonce, there would be no Taylor Swift, there would be no Madonna. None of these women would have existed without Tina Turner. By the mid 70s, her marriage to Ike was in crisis. He became even more controlling of Tina's career and brutally abusive behind closed doors. He was paranoid about me leaving. So that was the beginning of the end. The violence and how evil he was. It was every day of every moment. Always angry with me. Oh, he treated me like I was a prisoner and he was the guard. Eventually, Tina fled into hiding before later emerging as a solo artist and crossing the Atlantic. Tina Turner, welcome to London. How long are you going to be with us this time? Well, quite a while. I'm um, <clears throat> also going to do some recording while I'm here for the first time. Mm. You've been on your own now for three years. Has it been very difficult to establish yourself as a solo artist? Have you almost had to start again in a way? Exactly, starting again. That's exactly what it was like two years of that. It was very difficult, but uh, it's sort of finally coming together now. You ask me if I love you, and I choke on my reply. When she did finally free herself, the message that was coming in was coming from England. So it was these English rock musicians, these white boys, they related to her. They understood what she was doing. Mick Jagger saw who she was. Her record company went to see her playing live because David Bowie wanted to go out and see her himself. And they wouldn't have been at that gig if it hadn't been for the fact that David Bowie thought she was the, the best female performer out there. During the period when I didn't have a record, all my British fans supported me. You've got such great musicians here and they need somebody to really stand on, on top of their music, really. That's what they've all said. They've always wanted a voice that could really stand in there and do what they, they've really wanted all the time. And, and I always wanted to do uh, uh, that for myself, to have that, the right music that I wanted under me. And it's always come from here. It's incredible. Now, Tina Turner celebrates her birthday on Saturday. At this very moment, she's in Dubai, but she's got a hit on her hands in Britain. Let me say the same thing, baby. I was first aware of Tina Turner via the great institution of Top of the Pops. They showed a video of Let's Stay Together. I just thought, what a great voice. Her voice struck me as being pretty special. You just didn't see black women inhabit that space, you know, in, in rock. I just have that image of strength, power, and assuredness. It was Mark Knopfler from Dire Straits, the biggest British rock band of the 1980s, who wrote her most famous album's title track. I'd written Private Dancer as a signal for respect. Tina just fastened on it straight away. I got to know what it was like to work in the studio with Tina. Nothing but a joy. And your pride. Tina made it the song it is. Mine was a kind of a smoky club style of a, an approach. But Tina's was just fists and, you know, seismic. She was playing to 180,000 people. 
We'd not seen that with women before, solo artists. It just did not happen. And Tina was one of the first. You couldn't imagine her doing anything else. She was just the absolute queen of that scene. She dominated it, just in the same way that she would dominate a song. The song that sums up Tina for me is the first one I ever heard, which is Proud Mary. I would just always remember Tina's pure, unadulterated joy at life. I always think of Tina's looking down on us now. If she's doing anything, she's rolling on the river. And happy, happy, happy about the fact that she's the queen of rock and roll, and always will be. The speaker has always been a central figure in the House of Commons. But it wasn't until Betty Boothroyd was appointed to this ancient role that often unruly MPs faced their first woman, their first high kicker, and someone whose panache was unbeatable. Are you wanting to interview? Yes. In that, no, in that case, keep quiet. Order! 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 The Honourable Gentleman will resume his seat immediately. Immediately! Spit it out! Come on! Betty was marvellous. Order, sit down! She kept the energy up. House must come to order! And that's what you want. You want it to be dynamic. And she created that atmosphere in the chamber. Mr Neil Kinnock. Betty was elected in a by-election. This is Betty Boothroyd, your Labour candidate. After, I think, contesting five elections before. Are you going to be voting for me tomorrow? I hope so. You hope so. <laughs> so do I too, yes. With a cheery smile like that, I'm sure you are. The name of the candidate elected is Betty Boothroyd. And all that preceded her was the knowledge that she'd been a tiller girl, a dancer. It's the tiller girls. My father was horrified, working class girl. Um, doing this, this is not, not right. So, instinctively, everybody looked at Betty's legs. I mean, it was, it was no, <laughs> <laughs> it was unavoidable. Um, and uh, she acted up to that role. Betty Boothroyd succeeds in becoming the first Madam Speaker. In keeping with tradition, she was dragged to the Speaker's chair, but once there, she reveled in the role. I'm the first speaker who declined to wear a wig. I felt I couldn't work in a wig. I couldn't do the job. I would be to have something heavy on my shoulders and on my head. And I, you see, I, 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 have a, I think I have a sense of humor. And I don't feel you can have a good laugh if you've got a full bottom wig on. And I'd be, I'd be scared of it sort of tipping sideways. Betty Boothroyd seemed to be a force of nature. I mean, what did she seem like to you when you came across her first time? She was a legend to my generation coming into Parliament. We'd grown up watching her on, on TV. Uh, so meeting her, it was like meeting a superstar. When you saw Betty in the chair, without a wig, but with a truly regal authority, is the word I can best use to describe Betty. She was one of nature's monarchs. There's no doubt at all about that. And when you see that, you know that she was born for the role. Order. There is no point in waiting for silence. The honorable gentleman isn't going to get silence. <laughs> Produce your voice, Mr. Hill. I mean, Betty never fired one barrel. She really let go with the full 12 ball. Was this at a high pitch or was she very measured? Was she sort of silent and deadly-ish? Uh, Betty was clinical. It was straight between the eyes, but with acidic deadliness. I do wish this house would listen to comments that are being made. So yeah, it's just over here. Sorry, the Queen. She was very at, at ease with herself. She, she knew herself well, and that is why everyone knew what she stood for. 
You look very fat. Yeah, yeah, come on. Not tall shoes, thank you very much. Blue shoes, we all say. Yeah, and tall. <laughs> if you have white hair, yes. Yeah, sure. Obviously, I wasn't from her party, but she wanted everyone to do well, and she cared about Parliament, and she cared about the Commons. Even though she was in the Lords by the time I came into Parliament, she would still come down to the Commons tea room. Normally, Lords and Commons don't mix. We're like water and oil. But she was always bubbling and fizzing and interested in other people. Westminster and When the talk was swirling and the gossip was going and the laughter was raising, Betty would be in the middle of that. She was always immaculately dressed, I can remember that. And the manicures. She just looked terrific. She did, and I think she knew how important that was. Uh, not just in terms of being professional and uh, showing respect to those that she was working with. Order. Order. But also in terms of getting her message across. She was there to persuade people uh, like a bulldozer, you know, and she knew that she needed to be suited and booted to, to get her message across, to land her messages with people. When you so memorably played that starring role in the coronation, I wonder if you were kind of channeling your inner Betty, that kind of <laughs> steely good humour. I, I like to think so, I like to think so. I think sometimes the power of an image, seeing a woman doing a particular role, being strong, has just a huge impact on uh, the aspirations of uh, particularly young, young girls and women. And Betty did that for her generation. What does the Palace of Westminster mean to you? It means everything to me. It is my entire life. I love it. I seek to cherish the great democracy we have here, which is very important. She did everything she could to demystify this place and to open it up to other people. And that's why Betty went on children's television programmes. And that's why she was, was there in places that you wouldn't normally have found a speaker at that time. Who's <laughs> online too? Claire Davis from Liverpool. Hi there, Claire. What's your question? Um, do you ever feel like smacking any of the politicians <laughs> because they sometimes act like unruly children? Well, I don't feel like smacking them. I, I feel like occasionally, and I do, taking them into my study to have a quiet word with them. <laughs> <laughs> she was box office television. She was wonderful. Oh, I had a lot of memorable moments. So many people came to visit. Westminster was on everybody's list. Nelson Mandela was the greatest person. I mean, he, I always, he was a great hero of mine. I always read a great deal about him. I said, now, take it easy down the steps because there's no banister. He said, I know. He said, I came here at six o'clock this morning and had a look. And he grabbed hold of my hand and uh, we helped each other, I think, down those uh, steps of Westminster Hall to his seat. And you were one of those in our mind. A great occasion. I am very privileged to be Speaker of this House. It's the best job in the world. I don't want any other. Better known for her cry of order, order, Betty Boothroyd called last orders on herself as she announced her retirement today as Speaker of the House of Commons. I now wish to inform the House of my intention to relinquish the office of Speaker immediately before the House returns from the summer recess. This, she said, would give her successor time to get used to the role before the next election. Be happy for me. <laughs> I had a wonderful life as Speaker. I enjoyed every moment of it. Time's up. <laughs> Just listen to the crowd as Charlton leads out England.
Sir Bobby, one of the greatest players in the world ever. And here comes Charlton. Oh, a great goal! Sir Bobby Charlton was first and foremost a truly magnificent footballer. Charlton trying to get the shot, it is on his right foot. Oh, beauty! What a gentleman. Had time for everybody and absolutely loved football. To Charlton. What a goal! But he was also a beautiful human being and a kind man. Football is, is so exciting and you feel part of it and, and when you see 11 men knitting together and, and doing something that, that's really, in, in a way, sometimes artistic, it's so, so lovely to watch. No, best, Charlton. That's a goal worth remembering, isn't it? I don't think that you can better it. Sir Bobby Charlton, the finest footballer of his generation, loved and admired on and off the pitch. Hailing from the northeast of England, he was destined for sporting greatness. I was born into a football family like no other. I mean, I, I don't know of anyone else. I had five uncles that all played professional football. If I was any good, I was going to be a footballer. There was no question that. To Matt Busby at his desk at Old Trafford came boys from all parts of the country, boys eager to play football under the greatest manager in the game. And thus began the legend of the Busby Babes. As soon as I got into Manchester United's first... for Sir Bobby was really the, the pureness of the way he struck the football. Um, and those balls were pretty heavy back then. But he'd hit them so sweetly without seeming to give it too much force. Charlton going for a one-two and getting it. Oh, what a goal! Just the timing was exquisite. And look at that for a beautiful ball. The way he could glide on the ball, he could go either way, he could go left or right when he was attacking defenders. So that'll do. And then his passing was really good. And then he had a terrific shot with both feet. Charlton, oh, what a goal! Oh, oh, what a goal! I never found the game difficult at all. Bobby Charlton. If anybody threw a ball to me, I had no problems controlling it and I had no, no problems using my right foot, my left foot. I couldn't really understand how, how people could find the game so difficult. That'll do for what a beauty. It all happened this afternoon in the gathering dusk and amid slow flurries when this VEA Elizabethan, which had been chartered by Manchester United. The plane was trying to take off from Munich. We never got off the floor and we ran into a house and we ran into, I think, a few other, a few other obstacles and, uh, and it was just a, a nightmare. 23 people were killed at Munich, including eight players and three members of club staff. I'd like to say a few words to my mother. I hope she's OK yes. and taking it well. Look at her while you're doing it. She, she, hasn't, she hasn't been down to see me, you know, but it's a bit a long way and I'm all right. I it know. have been a bit worse off, like some of the others. Most of them that were killed were really good personal friends of mine. It's unbelievable, really, that something like that should happen and all your pals get killed and suddenly you're, you're there with hardly a scratch on you. I just... Sometimes I feel it doesn't seem right, you know. The disaster struck at the heart of Manchester and the whole of the footballing world. On quite a few occasions, I've been over to the Munich Memorial. Once, I was quite fortunate. Sir Bobby actually said, uh, let's have a walk, Brian. We walked up to the end of the road where the runway was, and he was saying, well, that's where, you know, the airport was, and, and, and then he said, and this is where uh, we were taken off. That was a bit of a special moment uh, for myself, for Sir Bob to actually, you know, talk to me, but really important for himself. We literally had to keep going, otherwise the club could have gone under.
But in 1966, the most famous date in English football, Bobby Charlton helped make history. You know, when I was 11 year old, the World Cup was on, you know, and I watched all the games with my mum and dad and my sister. It now gives me great pleasure to declare open the eighth World Football Championships. Prior to, the, to 1966, the England team had, were almost unbeaten, and we kept getting better and better and better. So what we played in the World Cup was uh, unbelievable. And that's why he became such a superstar as a footballer all around the world. Bobby Charlton in possession. Another fine save. And that's what really sort of got me. I wanted to be a footballer. We knew that we had done something that will never ever happen again here in our, in our lives. To be the best team in the world was uh, was just magic. Ten years after the Munich disaster, Bobby Charlton captained Manchester United when the team finally conquered Europe. People ask me which is the most important game in our, that I ever played, and I, I tend to say, well, the World Cup in 1966 but it wasn't as difficult to win as the European Cup. And you're doing that with players that you play with every day. The first time an English club had won the European Cup, it was for what Samad Busby had done, and, and the players who had died, it was a way of actually acknowledging their, their contribution to what Manchester United was. And that is it. The match was really all about Bobby Charlton's last league appearance. I saw Sir Bobby Charlton play so many times. It was, I suppose, towards the latter stages of his career, but he was clearly a very, very special talent. And listen now to the applause as Charlton leaves league football. This year's Lifetime Achievement Award goes to Sir Bobby Charlton. I've played a long time and I won some things, trophies, etc. But the award from the, for the BBC is something, something that's different. I'm so proud of it, really. Um, it was so emotional with all the audience uh, applauded. I, I, I just couldn't, couldn't believe it. Gary was, um, was in charge and, and I said, he, he, can you blow a whistle or something? I said, because otherwise we're never gonna get home. It was my brother Jack that was giving it to me as well, which was, which was really special too. Bobby Charlton is a, the greatest player I've ever seen. He's my brother. <laughs> well done, Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Bobby Charlton. It was just uh, one, one of the very big highlights. <laughs> The legacy that he's left is, is the important thing for us young players coming through in the game. To see how respectful he was, to see how he, he managed himself despite his success, he never got ahead of himself. Never too big for his boots. It's strange being at Manchester United and he's part of the furniture and, and so not to be seeing him around on match days and everything, like, that's a massive loss to the club. A true footballing icon, Sir Bobby Charlton. For over a century, Old Trafford has been the stage on which heroes have busied themselves building dreams. Today, the South Stand is renamed in honour of arguably the greatest of them all. He was the Busby Babe who became a knight of the realm. The incomparable Sir Bobby Charlton.
Elizabeth I has been played by some movie greats, from Betty Davis to Judi Dench to Kate Blanchett. But for millions of television viewers in the 1970s, the role was defined by one actor, Glenda Jackson. She played a queen, a king, and a real part in politics. If I was to close my eyes and think about Glenda Jackson, i think of a woman of small stature with incredible power. How cruel. How can you say that? Don't I live? Everyone thinks they can do as they like with me! Even you! I loved her strength, really. That passionate intensity. Every muscle was taut and her face was a was a, a an amazing picture of strength. Ladies and gentlemen, Glenda Jackson. You came from a, a very ordinary background, didn't mm, you? Yes. Your uh, your dad was sort of bricklayer, wasn't That's it? Right, Something yes, like that. Yes. And you said also to me earlier on that uh, when you were at school, you were sort of a fat, spotty-faced child, mm. and this sort of thing. Mm. In the, those early days, what did you want to be? I left school without wanting to do anything in particular and no qualifications for anything. So I worked in Boots Cash Chemists for two years. <laughs> and um, while I was there, I joined an amateur dramatic company at home. And someone said, as someone always does, you should do this professionally. So I wrote off to the only drama school I'd ever heard of, which was RADA, and I got a scholarship, and there I was for two years. Yeah. What kind of parts did you get there when you were at, at, at RADA? Well, we didn't really have parts until our last term, but they told me, you know, don't expect to work until you're 60 because you're basically a character actress. How wrong her drama teachers were. She became a major movie star with Women in Love in 1969. How much do you love me? How much do you think I love you? I don't know. But what's your opinion? Very little indeed. Why don't I love you? Well, I don't know why you don't. I've been good to you. When you first came to me in that fearful state, I had to take pity on you, but it was never love. And she followed that success in the romantic comedy, A Touch of Class. And may I point out, as you have so obviously never noticed, women are a little different from men. They require time, a little sensitivity. English women. Oh, women! Anybody but a superannuated Boy Scout would know that! <laughs> it's got my name on it. Yeah. She won Oscars for both, but didn't go to Hollywood to collect either. It came as a total surprise. It never occurred to me that I'd actually get it. Oh, come on now, you Truly, couldn't have forgotten. No, I had forgotten that they were last night. Um, and it wasn't until the phone rang at six o'clock this morning that um, I remembered. But well, what did you say then? Probably something unrepeatable on family television. For years, the Oscars stood on her mother's sideboard. There she is. Isn't she? she looks extraordinary, oh, doesn't she? Yes. Gorgeous. She always sort of held her hand like that, I remember. But look, what a beauty, actually. And this is not quite as glamorous a shot. There's a young Celia Imrie in here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, now you see, she always joined in with us. This is at Niagara Falls. <laughs> <laughs> you look like you're members of some sort of cult. Yes, I know. It was a world tour of Hedda Gabler, directed by Trevor Nunn, for the Royal Shakespeare Company. It was a very starry cast, actually. Patrick Stewart, Timothy West. I was a tea girl and the assistant stage manager. I was nervous because she was such an icon, but she was very ungrand. All the time that I worked with her in 1975, she always looked after the underlings. She found out when my birthday was, and there was champagne and a cake, you know, from her. She was fierce, actually, like a lioness on our behalf. Did you believe I would send you back to Scotland at the head of a great army? Did you believe I would sacrifice my reputation on your behalf? It is not enough, madam, to speak one's mind in season and out as you do. That is not the conduct of a queen. It is the outpouring of a pampered woman demanding that all indulge her. But wasn't she stunning, though? You know, that marvelous scene in Women in Love when she's dancing with the Highland cattle. Yeah.
particularly in Mopin Wise, actually. I thought she looked absolutely gorgeous. But her strong political beliefs began to come to the fore. Where an actress has strong political opinions, mm. is she justified or even wise mm. in parading them before her public? Totally, yes. Totally. I cannot see why one's profession should preclude one having political beliefs. Don't you think you are in a privileged position if you're on the stage, if you are an entertainer, of using that entertainment medium to, no, put, I don't. to put over I, a political I, message? Not at all. Will you welcome, please, the man who's made our dreams come true, the next Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, you try to dissuade her from entering the House of Commons. Yes, I said to her actually, look, you, in the end, you can do more good for the cause by being the Oscar winner, mm -hmm. Glenda Jackson, descending from on high to bless us poor plebeians with your presence. And she said, no, it's bloody rubbish. So I have to accept that it was bloody rubbish. But that's the seat that Glenda Jackson is trying to take. Glenda May Jackson, the Labour Party candidate, 19,193. <laughs> Glenda Jackson adds the words MP to Oliver the two Lewin Oscars she won as an actress. Glenda Jackson was an MP for 23 years. Rising to the position of Transport Minister, she had to travel to Europe, where she found the detail of one EU debate rather tedious. During the coffee break, I said, hey, Glenda, uh, are you all right? And she said, fine. And I said, because um, there's no trouble at home or anything, because you, know, you keep popping out. Yeah, I'm going for a fact, she said. Right you are. I said, uh, yeah, I, I, I understand that. In any case, she said, it's just so bloody boring. The whole thing is boring. Glenda Jackson. Speaker. It's hardly a surprise that Baroness Thatcher was that careless. That speech that she made um, after Margaret Thatcher's death was pure Glenda. Everything I had been taught to regard as a vice, and I still regard them as vices, under Thatcherism was in fact a virtue. Greed, selfishness, no care for the weaker, Sharp elbows, sharp knees. They were the way forward. It's an amazing speech, and kind of only really an actor could have done that speech in the way that she did it. I think she just had such strength in knowing what she was capable of doing, you know, and then to go back into acting. And to take on the role of King Lear, which is one of the biggest roles in Shakespeare. In fact, it probably is the biggest. And at the age of 80. Her coming back after all those years was an extraordinary thing, actually. Tell me about the kind of Lear she was. I never, ever thought about gender. And she said once that once you get to that age, gender is kind of irrelevant, and men and women just all look the same. She really did exude power, and she ruled that stage. Do you find the process of acting is getting easier as you get older? Are you kidding me? Probably my easiest performance was the first one I ever gave, because it, I was blessed with total ignorance. Every performance now is a life and death situation, and that doesn't get any easier. It's like standing on the top of a very, very high diving board, and you don't know if there's any water in the pool, and you do that every night. There was a lot of vulnerability there. And I think once she got the opening night out of the way and she realised she could do it, then she relaxed. And I think she just needed that confidence again to, you know, for an audience to say, you're back, we're welcoming you, and you're still as fantastic. After King Lear, we met for lunch. Jane Horrocks and I were King Lear's daughters. And as we sat down for lunch, she said, well, I don't have any daughters to leave anything to, and presented me with this beautiful necklace. Wow. Isn't it beautiful? It really Isn't is. Isn't it gorgeous? It looks Elizabethan. It? I mean, yeah, it probably was, actually. 
so I wear it for good luck. Mm. <laughs> She's been a light in my life. A marvellous mixture, actually, of fragility and toughness and courage. And I must go. No. Let me go alone. Michael Parkinson brought many lives well lived into our living rooms. Evening and welcome. Growing up, I would have always watched, uh, obviously, Match of the Day on the Saturday night, and the precursor to that was, was always the Parky show. Hello, Parky. Oh, hello, Parky. It's so nice to see you back on your show again. A proud Yorkshireman. His love of cinema and sport shone brightly throughout his years as the nation's most watched chat show host. To keep yakking when we got this back. We used to watch that show together. You know, in the good old days when families used to watch shows together, that was one of them. Parkinson was famous people times a hundred. And of course it was rare to see them. They weren't always there to sell something. So it was an opportunity to hear and to get to know Hollywood legends. He interviewed, you know, Orson Welles. A lot of directors and actors like to run their movies, you know. Their idea of a happy night at home is to turn on the projector and see one of their pictures again, you know. And I can't think of anything more horrifying, you know, because you can't change it. Yes. What can you do about it? Yes. There it is, yeah. forever. You would look forward to it all week because there was going to be someone on television who was never on television or who was on so rarely. The whole thing has been a wonderful life. I've been tremendously fortunate. I, I consider every day gravy. <laughs> <laughs> they had Cagney and figures like that, James Cagney, for heaven's sake. You decided to retire during the making of that film, one, two, three, didn't mm -hmm. you? What was the moment you decided? So they said, uh, we're ready, Mr. Cagney. And I said, we're right with you. And I turned around, walked in, and I said, this is it. No more. So I called it a day then. He really understood who they were. You can't be Frank, and you can't be Stevie Wonder, and you can't be Marvin Gaye. You can't be those people. Be the best Sammy Davis that you know how to be. The grandeur of the old Hollywood star, Betty Davis, coming on. Wow, she's in England, let alone she's not only just in England, she's in my room. She's there, and she's telling stories, and it's amazing. If you look back on the history of Hollywood, there have been what? I suppose three great women stars, haven't there? Garbo, Hepburn, yourself. Would you, would you agree with that running order? Well, I, I would accept the running order, yes. <laughs> of course, I'd be happier if I got first billing, but I'll tell you. <laughs> so when you saw them, it, it was a special thing. He's without doubt the most beautiful and complete athlete I've ever seen. To others, he's a political leader, a figurehead in the battle between black and white, and yet to more people who care little about sport and even less about politics, he's one of the world's great entertainers, a character, a comedian, and a sometime poet. Here he is in all his splendor. Ladies and gentlemen, Muhammad Ali. That interview between Parky and Muhammad Ali is the slow process of getting this great man to just open up and reveal so many facets of himself. Can I ask you what, what, what the problem is, if it is a, indeed a problem to you, about being regarded as one of the world's most attractive men and the kind of fan no. adulation you have from women? A, a fan what? Fan worship. <laughs> from who? Women. Oh, I don't pay no attention to it. I don't, I don't consider myself no attractive man. People like Tom Jones. You know? <laughs> <laughs> He's a network, and Elvis Presley, I'm not nothing like that. Well, whether you want it or not, you are. I mean, people for years have been saying you want <laughs>
you have ever seen a play. The speed, unbelievable, of his brain explains the speed of his hands as a boxer. I'm not going to argue with you. <laughs> You're not as dumb as you look. <laughs> the intelligence, something which I don't know if American TV really pulled out of him. When was your first recollection as a child? of being a second-class citizen, second being treated class, like one. No, <laughs> more fifth, 16th class. And I always ask my mother, I said, Mother, how come is everything white? I said, why is Jesus white with blonde and blue eyes? Why is the <laughs> Lord's Supper all white men? Angels are white, Pope and, and um, Mary and every, even the angels. I said, Mother, when we die, do we go to heaven? She said, naturally, we go to heaven. I said, well, what happened to all the black angels when they took the pictures? <laughs> Parky talked to Muhammad Ali, the man. What plans do you have for the, for the future now, for, apart from, from fighting? Well, just, uh, f I'll tell you something. I don't think I've ever said this before, but I'll tell you. I really care nothing about boxing. Boxing is just to introduce me to the struggle. Like, when I speak, I draw people in the States to draw my people, to teach them various things, which will give them dignity, pride, and self-help. So boxing is just going to be another year, but my main fight is for freedom and equality. It really did make people realize what an extraordinary human being he was. I asked how much money was I getting, you know, for taking up all my time. You know, I used to get a little paid for this. <laughs> and they said, you don't, your budget's kind of lower and you don't pay too much. <laughs> so I wrote a poem and I'm going to close with this. I love your show and I like your style. But your pay is so cheap, I won't be back for a while. <laughs> and that's the thing. Parkinson delivered treats. Hi. <laughs> How you doing? I'm well, thank it's you. It's Michael you. Parkinson! <laughs> oh! We come on this show, Parky, because you is the institution. Everyone around the country love you. I mean, obviously, apart from young people. <laughs> <laughs> I went to the doctor the other week. I said, what's good for wind to give me a kite? <laughs> Could I just ask you one deeply personal question? Of course. Is that a toupee? <laughs> and he made incredible relationships. Um, and one of those relationships was extraordinary because it was Michael Parkinson and Billy Connolly. Billy Connolly. <laughs> oh! It was that relationship with Parky and going back on the show, you know, many, many times that fixed Billy Connolly in the hearts and the minds of people everywhere. You see, this guy was going out to meet his friend in the pub. The whole of Britain became aware of this extraordinary Scots genius. You know, the famous park your bike 
story. He said, did you hear about the one, the guy had done his wife in and that? And I said, no. I said, sure enough, there's a big mound of earth. There's a bum sticking out of it. <laughs> he says, is that her? He says, aye. He says, would you leave a bum sticking out for? He says, I need somewhere to park my bike. <laughs> You develop a kind of connection with Michael Parkinson. When he's killing himself with laughter, you are thrilled for him. And what's a working class lad like you doing with a suit like that? Do you like it? It's a sort of substitute for tattoos. I'm frightened to get a tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> I love to show, and I'd actually appeared on it a couple of uh, occasions as well. It's quite the experience. I mean, you, you made this, in a sense, a kind of seamless transition, it seems, from being the football into, into the media. Mm. Uh, well, it, it seems <laughs> to be that way. Were there, were there problems? I mean, I think presenting on television is something that I've, I've had to learn and I'm still very much, a, very much a novice. And in football, you're not on your own so much either. Yes. You know, and you, you could be found out with that camera. It tends to look <laughs> very closely at you. He was an amazing broadcaster, a brilliant interviewer. <laughs> and he was, he was always a great, great host. Welcome, please, Jane Horrocks. I couldn't wait to tell my mum and dad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they loved Michael Parkinson. And they came to watch it that night. Were you nervous? Yes, I was very nervous. I had to sing live on it. And, uh, yeah, that was quite terrifying. Be wise, be smart, behave my heart. Don't I liked Parkinson because he was a great listener and he wasn't the star of the show. He made the person who he was interviewing the star and he wasn't trying to be the most important person there. Whatever you want, you can say, yes. We, we have a fr full and frank discussion here about <laughs> any topic. We will do operations here, we'll do sexuality, anything at all. You can't shock us, go on. Oh, well, no, no. He sort of had a humbleness about him, which um, was very endearing and likeable. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Fry. I was on lot. You feel that you're in perfect hands. You don't feel the conversation's going to run out. You don't feel your mouth's going to turn dry and you can't remember a story. Somehow he relaxes you. I mean, was that an ambition when you were a, a child to be a movie star? Is that what you imagined you <laughs> might be? A film star, named by the title? Well, if I'm deeply honest, I'm afraid, yes. <laughs> Little part of it. One I remember most particularly that I did was when I was on with Robin Williams. <laughs> <laughs> the drag dolphin savaging the women slowly but surely. Ex we're we're exactly. only finding the evening gown. You're, you're right. Edith Head Dolphin. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> you're mad, but you're right. <laughs> <laughs> he, he simply was a genius, a one-off genius of comedy who, uh, who was able to do things at, at speed that no one else you ever met was able to do. <laughs> Major does become mine, I have you not known. <laughs> Speak to me and run, gentle moose, and I'll call your name. <laughs> Go, oh pinch faced one, oh giant rat, and call me not till Tony Blair does say the word and George be not going into the bush, we shall. <laughs> Parkinson brought out, of course, his, his performance wit, and, and it was just such a pleasure to be, to be sitting with him. Well, well it's, been, it's been fun. It's been terrific. <laughs> Oh, well, we're back. <laughs> back, on Once again. back on planet Earth. I do know, it's nice to be the quiet one. Right. You know? <laughs> it was an event. And now, I think, you know, the people who succeeded Parky are brilliant, but it's harder for it to be an event. Well, let's, let's do Michael's favourite song, OK? This day and age we're living in gives cause for apprehension if I were one of those people who writes the summation of people's lives after they've died... Ladies and gentlemen, Tony Bennett. I would be so grateful to Parkinson. You must remember this. A kiss is still a kiss. A song hello, hello, Parsons. I think I'm overdressed. <laughs> You've only got to look at the crop of people who died recently. What an honour to be on this, isn't it? To be in Parky, Swivel, Chet, it's still warm off Liam Neeson. <laughs> <laughs> it's the closest I'm going to get, isn't it? That's <laughs>
ladies and gentlemen, Paula Grady. So I was in all sorts of little drag acts. Most of them were all in sequins, and they were Shirley Bassey orientated. You know, it was all very glamour. I went the other way with Lily, and um, sort of gave her a skirt, so we were the tassel and roots. You know, she had a tattoo and a love bite. You know what I mean? And, you put the thing on me face. <laughs> You're dead, mate. Ladies and gentlemen, Raquel Welch. Do you find it difficult for people to take you seriously in the business? Oh, I don't know. I'll tell you, I don't think it's wildly important that everybody take everybody really seriously. Dr. Henry Kissinger. Did you have any sort of sense of destiny, any indication that one day you might become one of the most influential men in the world? Absolutely not. Gina Lollobrigida. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Yarwood. I'd like to um, thank my guests. I'd like to thank Sir Harold Wilson for being with us. I'd also like to thank uh, Mike... Um, <laughs> Mike Yarwood. We'll see you again next week. Goodbye. <laughs> You want to know something about them? Yes, you can. You can read, you know, their Wikipedia entries these days and things like that. But you're far better off going to their Parkinson appearances, where, where you really do get a sense of, of of who they were. You went on the freedom marches, didn't you, with uh, Martin Luther King? Well, Harry Belafonte was. A, we we started out together, and uh, he's, he he told me about the problem. There's no question that Dr. King would have stood in history as other great men have stood in terms of having dramatically changed the course of all of it. But how different do you think it would have been had he not been killed? Do you think it would have been better for the black people in America? I'm almost positive it would have been better for the world. Parkinson stands as a record of their lives and their way of thinking and why we valued them. Here, talking turkeys, is Benjamin Zephaniah. Be nice to your turkeys this Christmas. Because turkeys just want to have fun. Turkeys are cool and turkeys are wicked. And every turkey has a mom. <laughs> you know, it's been tough for me uh, in London because I can't, you know, it's a lovely city and I can't really, can't really walk around because I'm getting, I'm getting recognized all the time. I think that may be because I walk outside of my flat and say, hey everyone, I'm Chandler from France. <laughs> We have to close down, sadly. Um, One hour's gone by already? Yeah, already. Boy, Hard to believe, time flies huh? when you're in good company, no? <laughs> <laughs> it's still the same old story. Fight for love and glory. The case of do or die. The world will always welcome lovers. As time. As time.